Hey everyone, welcome back to North Idaho Tables. Today we're working on this massive uh, 14 and a half foot black walnut table. The base for this table is pretty basic. It's a really common design. It's not really our specialty, but this table is for an interior designer and sometimes just less is more. Now surprisingly, this is actually the first table we've built for an interior designer specifically. And if I'm being completely honest, I was actually kind of nervous about it. I don't know why, but I just felt like it could be a huge thing for the company, uh, just getting the word out there. Unfortunately, the interior designer that reached out to have this built, she ended up being just absolutely awesome to work with. And I think there's gonna be more tables in the future. Now, you basically you see me welding this base together. Um, typically, I'll do these out of like two by three material, um, but since this is such a massive table, I ended up building this one out of two by six. The most important part on this table base design is just keeping everything nice and square. I'm not sure if there's anything worse than walking up to a table and seeing really crappy welds or seeing something that's like visibly out of square. Just take your time and do it right the first time. Use lots of tack welds, just keeps everything where it's supposed to be. Now you see me here just stitch welding these. You don't have to fully weld this out. A lot of people will make that mistake. If you were to weld this part out completely, you're just adding a bunch of heat that's not necessary and it's gonna cause it to warp. And if your mounting plate isn't flat or isn't straight, over time you're gonna basically put that torque on the wood after it's bolted up and the wood's gonna try to follow that. So eventually your wood might start cupping enough just to follow the warped part. Learn from my mistakes though here. When you're grinding, it makes metal hot. You don't have to touch it. I've said it in previous videos though. Um, I'll say it again. The most important part of a table build is the quality, right? So if your metal finishing isn't up to par and you need to work on it, like seriously focus on it. it. It'll make a huge difference in the final product. One thing that will help you though, is when you're grinding, go from one end of the weld to the other weld if you're able to. And what that does is it allows the grinder and all your grind marks to basically even out the part so they're all the same and you're not making little gouges. And when it comes to metal finishing, like all your corners, those are important too. If your weld's kind of bulging out and sticking out, it's not gonna look right once powder coats on there. I'm a big fan of using files. They're a little bit tricky at first. Uh, sometimes you can make it worse rather than better. But once you figure out the technique that works for you, uh, it's, it's just money. Now, as I've already said many times, details matter, right? So one little step though, spray some WD-40 on your part, take a little chisel, clean off all your little weld BBs, all the spatter. Now once again, I go over to Maverick Sawmill over just south of Portland. Nick over there is absolutely great to deal with, no complaints, and he's always willing to help give advice. This book match slab was actually about six, seven inches too long to fit in my 16 foot enclosed trailer. So we had to trim it down just a little bit. Plus I think Nick just wanted an excuse to pull out the big chainsaw. Here's a real quick tip. When you go to pick up these big slabs, get yourself some like five inch PVC pipe, put them in your trailer, then you can just roll the slab in there. Makes your life way easier. In order to get the overall width that we want on this table, we did a book match setup, but it kind of left us a little bit of a crotch on the end. In a previous video, I recommended using this tape for filling these cracks. And I will say it works great with your fast set epoxy, but deep pour, that stuff's like water. It'll go anywhere and everywhere. So I ended up redoing this with kind of building the mold around it. And since I didn't want it leaking out this time, I used a whole bunch of that flex paste stuff. It works great. One thing I definitely did do wrong though, and I think it's kind of an honest mistake, is I used mold release, but I only used it on the inside of where I put silicone. I didn't put it on the outside, so it didn't allow for if the silicone was not gonna hold the epoxy, which in my case, the epoxy got past it. And uh, you can kind of see here, kind of defied it quite a bit. So in hindsight, 
just coat the whole part with mold release. It'll make your life a lot easier. And keep in mind though, working with like a 15 foot slab, these things aren't light. They're not easy to move, they're not easy to flip. It's kind of a chore every time you gotta do something on the other side. Quite often you'll see somebody do a pour with epoxy when it's all cured. You'll see them take it over to a big CNC table or run it through some kind of huge belt sander. But I don't know anybody with a sander that big where I live. So just stuck with hand sanding. But I will say that Festool Rotex, it's kind of a monster, so it makes quick work of it. I typically like to use kind of a dull chisel to get most of the bark off. And then I'll come back with the sander and do like a light sand on it. Try not to remove the natural shape of the edge. For all the smaller uh, cracks and voids, I like to use DIY epoxy. That's called Speedy Peedy. Sets in like 15 minutes and sandable not too long after that. DIY epoxy is actually based here in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, near me. So it's pretty convenient. I can just go to their little storefront and pick up epoxy whenever I need it. Now they did give me a discount code if anybody else wants to use it. It's just NIT10, so like North Idaho Tables 10. Epoxy definitely isn't cheap, but if you use that discount code, I think it gets you 10% off. Once the epoxy is cured, I like to come back with the Festool Rotex with like 80 grit or 100 grit and just keep the sander flat. My son Maverick, he's been uh, getting back on his cutting boards a little bit when he's got time. Shakuri boards, cutting boards, whatever you want to call them. I don't know about you guys, but I definitely wouldn't want to take a spray bottle to try to water pop this. So I grab a hose. Now I love using my little trim routers for stuff that I shouldn't, like trying to put C channel in. And I absolutely killed this one. In order to finish this time, I grabbed my grandpa's old router. It's pretty stout. Finished off what I needed to do, but later that day I actually went and bought a new Festool router. And that thing's actually pretty impressive as well. When my grandpa passed away, this is one of the tools I got. I don't know, there's something about it. When you use it, I just think of all the stuff that he used to make. And it's just kind of special. Now I'm a super big fan of Forstner bits. For one, they drill straight. They're great for marking center. In these C channel, you can give them a little twist so they self-center. You give them a little tap and then that point gives you a perfect little spot to set the drill bit. If you're not already using threaded inserts, I highly recommend it. Uh, if you're still using like lag bolts or something into a table, I just feel like you're kind of behind times. I like to add just a little dab of CA glue. So when they go in, uh, it's kind of just giving it its little bite and it follows the threads. Now if the slab you're working on has some soft or punky wood, take some thin CA glue and kind of spread it around the wall of the hole. Use the hardener and to really help that threaded insert have some bite. On one end of the table, right in the center, we had this uh, decent sized crack. The interior designer and I decided that we didn't want to fill this crack with epoxy. So instead of just leaving it and not doing anything, on the bottom side I put in three bow ties to help it from ever trying to open up. I personally am a big fan of leaving cracks natural if I can and not fill them with epoxy. I just love that rustic vibe that it gives. And I know a lot of people are concerned about getting food down in there and it getting stuck or it's hard to clean. But this crack is big enough that it'd be pretty easy to blow something out if you really needed to. If you haven't had a chance yet, try to find one of these Rotex sanders, do a demo on it or something, but the amount of material that they can remove and the time that they can is absolutely impressive. And for me, I found this is the nicest way or the best way for me to kind of knock those bow ties down. In the past, I've had a lot of people reach out to me and ask if these tables are stable or if they're shaky. Now, the big key here is don't be afraid to put a lot of threaded inserts on your mounting surface for that mounting plate. The more, the better in my opinion. There's just no way I would deliver a table if it was wobbly or shaky. These people are spending a decent amount of money. Their table needs to be solid. Like all my previous videos, I like Rubio Monocoat. It's what I found is the, the easiest for me to apply and I always get great results. I typically do one coat on the bottom and that's because once there's one coat on the bottom, I like to flip it over to do the top side. And I'm not gonna flip a finished table over to do the bottom side again. I really like this clip. It kind of just gives you an idea of how massive this slab really is. 
So yeah, I'll do one coat on the bottom, flip it over while it's still wet. So if I need to fix any marks from flipping it, then do one coat on the top, let it cure uh, like 24 hours. I think next day I come back and I use red scotch bright just on my little sander. This will kind of give you that white kind of satin look on the wood. It's just giving a little bit of a scuff, something to bite into for the next coat. Now speaking of that crack that we left exposed, one thing I like to do is I like to just put a little bit of extra and I'll flood it kind of into that crack and then use a little bit of compressed air to force it down there. And that way it just kind of gets into all the nooks and crannies. Something I've been wanting to try is the new ceramic coatings. Cam over at Blacktail Studio uh, now has his own N3 nanotechnology finish. So for this table, I actually uh, talked to the interior designer, told her what it was and what I thought it would do for the table. And I ended up doing it basically just for what the cost of materials were for it. Um, I wanted to learn how to do it, but I also didn't want to charge for it in case it didn't go good. But it's pretty impressive. I mean, you can see the difference in sheen and like color, just what it brings out. So another company that I highly recommend you guys reaching out to is Medallion Maker Branding. They make these brass little medallions all in a laser. You can do like a patina finish like this one. Um, some are nail on, some are screw on. You can glue them in. But the quality and the customer support and service, I realize what I'm trying to say, is absolutely awesome. Um, highly recommend reaching out to them. For the longest time I wasn't branding my tables, but it's kind of a huge mistake because I want people to see my table and want to be like, man, who built that? And then come to me. Most of my business is word of mouth, so might as well brand them. People will see it and hopefully find you. When dealing with a table that weighs as much as this does and as long as this is, your chances of bumping into something are pretty high. So I like to wrap these in moving blankets and then I shrink wrap them. Lucky for me, I've got some good friends. I think I had eight people show up and help me deliver this table. I found that using six foot lifting straps will stand the table up on edge and then we'll stand shoulder to shoulder. We'll each have the strap and allows us to walk with the table pretty close to the ground and fit through doorways. Um, for me, that's the best method for these monsters. Now since this table as long as it is, I ended up doing three bases. So one on each end and a small one in the middle. Just because of the sheer weight, this table would flex over time. Now I don't think this is the heaviest table I've done. It's definitely the longest, but I've done one that was a little bit wider. But this thing was just a monster to deal with. I mean, it took everybody's effort to do it. Even a little tanner wanted to get in and help. One thing that I find that's kind of funny is once we got this table upright, I realized we had it in the house backwards. So we had to flip it. This table is on the more basic design side wise, but it definitely had its challenges from sanding it to delivering it to flipping it to just making sure you didn't damage it. There's a lot going on. I love that when you walk into this house, it's the first thing that you see. From what I've been told is it's the main talking point on this house, which is pretty awesome. Hope you guys enjoyed the build, seeing the process. If you guys want to see more, I've got some pretty sweet projects coming up. Just give me a like and subscribe, and uh, I'll keep posting. If you have a second, leave me a comment. Let me know what you think of this table. I think it turned out absolutely beautiful, but it's definitely on the basic side. Do you guys like them crazy or do you like them simple?